And we're streaming. All right, great. Well, thanks everybody for coming out to e-conference number eight. Uh, we had to start a little bit earlier this morning. This will be kind of a one-time thing. Uh, we just wanted to make sure that uh, those that wanted an e-conference today uh, could also uh, have their uh, their ability to get to the Beyond the Lakes meeting if you are a member of Glippa. So we just wanted to make sure that those two things lined up today. Uh, but we have a, a nice packed um, session schedule this morning slash afternoon. Um, we've got Keith Davis from uh, from Notre Dame from the Digital Visualization Theater uh, introducing us to Python. Um, this is not how to use the Python pro programming language, uh, much more of an introduction of how it's how it can be used in astronomy and in planetariums and sort of why you might be interested in, in the first place. Um, we're going to have a, an update today. Uh, we had a change from last week uh, from Mark Subarau about the COVID-19 uh, task force and their survey of uh, IPS and non-IPS members and how uh, COVID-19 has affected uh, facilities around the world. And then, of course, we have our, our weekly segment. So this week, uh, Anna Green back with more long German words, in which case these are longer German words than usual. These are really fantastic. Um, Justin Bartle's back with Totally Bored. Uh, we have at 12.30, uh, Mary Holt with her podcasts. And then at 12.40, we have a brand new segment we've called Crossing Over. Uh, it's with Chris Isidore of the Buell Planetarium over in Pittsburgh. Um, it is, we don't have any idea how this is going to go over, um, mainly from the tech side. But it's, uh, it's a virtual field trip. I think you'll enjoy it uh, and really kind of, getting to the very cutting edge of what it means to do digital outreach uh, in uh, in this sort of COVID era. So we'll see how that goes. Um, this, of course, is a one conference week. Uh, so we have today. Next week, we'll have Wednesday and Friday at noon. That does, of course, mean because it is a week with days that end in day, there will be a virtual hospitality suite. I'll turn it over to Mark Webb for a little bit. Uh, as always, though, it's Thursday, 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Mountain, 6 p.m. Pacific. Mark, go ahead. Um, yes, there will be a virtual hospitality suite this week. Um, I will be putting up the announcement of that immediately after this e-conference and putting out a reminder on Thursday afternoon. Um, this week, uh, I, I'd like people to bring some stories. Uh, preferably funny stories of something that's happened to them in their dome or astronomy related. Uh, we may be having a special presentation. I don't want to uh, say too much about that until it's confirmed. Um, but uh, be thinking about the funniest slash craziest thing that's ever happened in your dome and uh, be prepared to share that with others. So uh, that's it Thursday, uh, Thursday evening. See you there. Fantastic. And so once again, if you're interested in uh, presenting in the future, we were going to, we, we loved how um, the dirty storytelling last week went. Um, we won't have that again this week, but uh, we'll, you'll, you'll probably see that at one of the, uh, one of the future hospitality suites again, but really love the, the camaraderie we've been building and that's worked out really well. So I uh, want to get going uh, right off the bat, give uh, Keith a little bit more time this morning than maybe what we had uh, had expected. So uh, Keith, it's right about 11.10. I'm going to turn it over to you. Keith Davis is the director of the Digital Visualization Theater at the University of Notre Dame in, or just outside of South Bend, Indiana. Uh, and uh, Keith, of course, has been an active member of GLIPA and of IPS and is uh, going to uh, be talking to us this morning, intro into Python programming. So Keith, uh, you have the floor. Okay, uh, well, uh, thanks for giving me the time to do this. I just thought that this would be, a, since we are doing these e-conferences and thanks to Mike and all the other people that are organizing those are these, um, I thought I might suggest to, that we take some time and think about programming, what it can do for us, learning how to do it. Uh, some people are in a position where they have less time than ever. That's very much how I feel right now, trying to transition what I'm doing online. Um, but I know some of us are in uh, the sometimes unfortunate position of having more time than they've ever had before. So I thought one of the things you might be able to do, we're all looking for new skills. Um, uh, I might 
give you sort of an intro to a skill that I've really enjoyed learning over the last few years. Um, so I'm going to switch over to PowerPoint. I'm going to zip around for a bunch of different things. Uh, so I should be able to share my little, and I think I'm just going to share the desktop and zip over to here. Okay, uh, hopefully everyone can see that, by the way. Um, I am gonna ask Mike if you will help me pay attention to the chat. I am happy to have people introduct, uh, interrupt, interrupt, interrupt <laughs> me during the presentation. Um, so Absolutely. just ask questions. Um, but sometimes when I'm talking, I forget to look at the chat thing to see what the questions are. So interrupt me if you have questions. So um, Planetary Me Conference, Python and you. So I'm gonna start with trying to get, there we go. Who am I? Uh, Mike already gave a short introduction. Um, I am the director of the Digital Visualization Theater at the University of Notre Dame. I've been there since 2008. The DVT is a 50 foot sky scan uh, dome. You can see off to the left, there's a totally staged shot of me not actually teaching, um, uh, but you can see the dome in the background there. So um, I've been teaching there, like I said, since 2008. At our facility, we are primarily for the university education and I am housed in the College of Science. So it is my job to serve uh, all of the departments in the College of Science, which include chemistry, biochemistry, physics, uh, which includes astronomy as well, um, math, another math, because <laughs> there's a separation between uh, computing math and uh, uh, pure math. And then um, did I say chem and biochem, whatever. The different departments that you typically find. And that means that I don't just do astronomy and that's forced me to try to find ways to uh, either take, uh, to create content that isn't just astronomy. Um, but I am gonna talk about how you can use uh, Python and other things for astronomy as well. So that's what puts me in the right place, I think, to talk about this is I have to do content that isn't astronomy and being able to create content in a computing format is the way that I think of Python and the way that I think of computing. Um, now in the past, <clears throat> um, I got my PhD in physics using a piece of code called Zeus 2D, which is written in Fortran. So I have some experience in that. Haven't touched it in decades though. Um, I did analysis with a, a, of that with a program called Interactive Data Language or IDL. That is a proprietary thing. Um, but in general, I've always been a bit of a dabbler in a lot of different programming languages. Uh, when I was coming through college, it was common to take one or two languages. Um, and I even started a little earlier than that. I got lucky and had a junior high school that had some programming bits in it as well. But that's my background. I am not and have never really been a fully professional programmer. I've always been a physicist or a planetarium director. Uh, so that means that I, if you have worked in that, um, uh, sort of setting. Uh, you may have a different way of looking at things than I do, but I think most of us here are not going to transition to be professional programmers. We're always kind of hacking our way through to try to find things that are useful. So what am I going to talk about today? I'm going to spend a good bit of time talking about programming com and really computing and uh, how that applies to language choice as part of making my case for Python as a good starter language. Um, and, a, well, I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, I'm going to show you some examples, and then I'll round it back up with some specific features of Python, and then how you might get yourself started. So the examples that we're going to spend a lot of time on, just showing you what the language looks like, showing you what the language feels like, and showing you some of the successful things that I've done with it in the past. Um, so what you have in front of you now is a lot of stuff. So we're going to go through this piecemeal. This is the way that I personally think about computing. I don't know that this is the way anybody else thinks about it. I did run one of my computer engineering students by it and, and she said it seemed like a pretty good way of organizing things. Um, if I think of computing, I think of having a purpose of something that I want to do with the powerful calculations that computers can do. Um, 
uh, you're going to need to give a computer some instructions uh, at some point, and that's usually going to be via a language of some type. Um, and then I need to think about, you need to think about where you're going to execute that code, and you're going to think about what result you want out of that code. Um, and all of these choices influence each other. And so I don't think you can really start at one place. Often you're going to start with a purpose, right? But sometimes you might have a set of tools that you know, and then you might walk backwards and find, well, what can I do with these tools? So I think it all kind of interrelates. Um, so to tell you a little about what these things are, let's start thinking about some examples of ways we might think of things. So I think it's very easy these days to use computers and never really think about what's actually happening when you do something. And I think that's intentional. Modern computer interaction design is designed to hide all of the complicated stuff, which is useful because we don't all need to be programmers just to go to a website, check our bank statement. Um, but it hides things so that it feels like it's magic. And I want to get out of the, the magic. So if I think of uh, what happens when you go to a website, um, you might be interacting with a language called JavaScript. JavaScript is often referred to as the language of the web. It is the set of instructions that means that when you click on something, uh, the browser that you are using changes what you're seeing. Um, it is usually executed on a server. A server is a computer that has uh, access to the internet that, other, that is exposed for other people to go to it. So when you're typing in a web address, uh, some things happen that eventually connect you to a computer sitting somewhere in the world that would generally be called a server. That server gets that request, builds something, you often using HTML, uh, and then uh, which is just the, the language that put stuff on pages, basically, and then sends it out. So JavaScript would be the interactive part. Um, uh, and then HTML is, uh, yeah, HTML is a markup language. That's right. Um, I'm not putting it in a language because, uh, so, sorry, so there's a question in the chat. I thought HTML was a language. It is often referred to a language. And in fact, the L refers to uh, language in HTML. But I'm not thinking of it as a programming language because it doesn't do things. It simply is a way of displaying things. Um, now, JavaScript, you would often use that to build HTML that you then send to a web browser. So the HTML is, is just, it marks up content that then automatic, then the browser interprets sees something that references an image and puts that image on the page in a specific place. But HTML doesn't do any calculation or computation or reaction to anything that's going on, or at least not much of that. Although as they develop new versions of HTML, they add stuff to it to get it out of JavaScript because it's just for convenience purposes. You also see that I have labeled under output a loop. Um, and this is something that I think most people that don't do a lot of interface style programming don't think of. Uh, if a computer is going to respond to something you're doing, whether it's um, a weather app on your phone, whether it's a server waiting for uh, instructions from a web browser, whether it's um, uh, just your basic computer interface with a mouse on it, if it's sitting there waiting for a user to do something, it has to kind of be an infinite loop. And so I think of um, a loop as being one of the outputs, one of the results. It's a loop that's responding in a particular way to things a user or a data source or whatever might do. It's interacting with the real world in a permanent or an ongoing way. Don't ever worry too much about that, but it's just, I thought it was important to include that. <clears throat> Um, under language, I'm including Java here. And the reason for that is that for a long time, uh, a lot of really interactive stuff on the web um, was done with Java. I don't know that that's as common as it used to be because there are a lot of uh, security problems with exposing Java to the web. Um, these days, it feels like you have to like tell them an Apple computer 17 times, yes, I really want to run that. No, it's not going to make my computer explode. Um, 
just because of that. But uh, Java is a language that could be used for interaction and was is very successful at being put as a little applet on the web. Um, so sometimes even today you'll see uh, if somebody's done a physics demo, it might be in Java. Uh, Flash is kind of a similar thing as well, although I've never used Flash, so I don't know much about it. Okay, uh, let's take another example to analyze how I think of this. Uh, you might think of an application. I think of an application as, like we said, something on your phone um, that operates, uh, it may be talking to a database somewhere, um, but its purpose is not to be a database. It may be, say, I have an app on my phone where I track all of the stuff that I eat. It is certainly connecting to a recorded database of all the stuff that I've eaten, of the types of foods that exist. But I don't think of it as being a database. I think of it as being a interface with this loop thing that allows me to conveniently interact with the database. So it's kind of working in the background. Um, but an application is any sort of self-contained thing that works, that is going to usually run on a device or on a PC um, uh, that a user is going to interact with in that loop way I described before. Uh, common languages for that are Java, uh, C is a common language for that. Um, Objective-C and Swift I've included together because to my knowledge, those only work for, um, uh, those only work on Apple devices. Those are specifically designed for Apple devices and written by Apple. Um, although Objective-C I think was in some ways based off of C, but that's a historical question that I didn't need to worry about. Um, so what I'm illustrating to you here is that different languages are going to be useful for different things. Here are just some examples. Um, calculation, in that, in, in terms of calculation, I think of as the realm of doing a lot of mathematics. Um, maybe it's based on some data from a database, uh, but generally I'm thinking of a simulation. Um, if you want to uh, do some calculation to do the path of a planet through space, if you're going to uh, do like what I did for my dissertation and calculate, um, uh, how fluid flows in an astrophysical context. Um, that would be, you're really doing a lot of calculation. For those things, usually you want something that is very low level or more low level than otherwise. Um, and that is going to, uh, uh, and the reason for that is that you want it to be fast. When you're doing huge numbers of calculation, um, producing large amounts of data, uh, you want it to be as fast as possible. That's why I include Fortran there. It's a very old langu language that has been used for a long time because it's one of the speediest ways to do math on a computer. Um, C is a nice low level language for that. You are usually going to run that on say somebody's personal computer or on what's called a cluster, which is a bunch of computers networked together to each break up a big problem into smaller problems. So this is what I think of often as scientific computing um, because you're not doing something that's for a general user. You need an expert that knows what they're doing to do that kind of calculation. Um, and usually your output is just some data, not necessarily the analysis of that data. It's just the, the data itself, which could be a series of tables. It could be a hierarchical format that's nice and um, uh, organized. It could be a lot of different so there's, those are just kind of some examples of the way I think of um, when you're thinking about what it means to do computing, I, I want, I think it's important to think about things in terms of what realm you're working with, uh, maybe what output you want, and then that can guide the tools that you use, because I think the languages and the platforms are really tools. Um, to serve either the realm in which you're working or the data. Now, many of these realms interface. So like you would certainly want, you might write an application that interfaces with a database or some calculations, but I think that it is useful to break up the core ideas um, uh, because you, you, these days, nobody uses one thing for everything. Uh, and there are good reasons for that. Okay. So you will note that I have not yet highlighted Python or mentioned Python. Um, if we were to pick Python and then see what can be done with it, I would say that at its base core, it is probably commonly used for analysis of data uh, and for visualization of data. And I do separate analysis and visualization 
um, although you can visualize to analyze as well. Uh, but to me, analysis is getting statistics out of data, um, trying to figure out, you know, if you're, you're trying to figure out what's happening, are we flattening the curve? You might, Python might be a good language to use for that. Um, uh, if you think of uh, visualization, though, to me, that's either for communication or sometimes for analysis. So it's a little different. Usually, you're going to be running it on a, if you're doing it, using it in its most simple form, you're going to be running it on a PC. Um, it can be used to create um, an interactive loop, so you can build applications with it. I probably should have highlighted application. Um, but I don't think that that's where people start with Python. Um, you can use it to create images, and you can use it to create HTML really, really easily. You can use it to create data, but I wouldn't normally do that um, with its core self. But Python is a nice, easy language to work with to do some of this stuff. But Python has a major advantage compared to a lot of other options. Um, Python is often referred to as language glue. And what that means is that you can actually use Python to control code written in other languages. And this is a big part of its power. And that means, and so for instance, um, you, there is a tool called Bokeh that actually allows you to write in Python, but do some magical behind the scenes stuff to do JavaScript and make an interactive web page. I hope to have some examples of that to share with everybody in a month. That's my new project. Um, uh, it is very common for people to write, uh, to allow Python to be an interface to some code written in C because C is so fast that uh, it's, it's, it's very common to do that. Um, uh, I've seen Python control Fortran. So people really like to write interfaces between Python and other languages. And that means that anything those languages can do, you can also do with Python. Um, I would never do direct calculation with Python unless it was small, just because Python's kind of slow, and we can talk about why that is later. <clears throat> OK. Hopefully, that gives you an idea of all the things that can be done with it. Um, and, and so the reason I wanted to take this approach is if you are in a space where you know computers are important but don't really know much about how they work, I wanted to break things up because I think you should think about what your realm that you're interested in using this for. Uh, you can probably hear one of my new cats playing in the background. Apologies for that. I think pets are part of the one of the best parts of Zoom meetings. Um, but uh, so I think it's important to think in terms of what do you want your output to be, what do you want your realm to be, and then think about the tools in between. I think Python is valuable as a general Swiss Army knife, and so it's a good place to start if you don't already know how you want to do things and what you want to do. Um, if people object or have things to say, please feel free to drop into the comment. I know, I'm sure there are plenty of people here that know as much, if not more, about this than I do. Okay, the key thing is a lot of this part is done with open source modules. And that's one of the really valuable aspects of Python is that there are tons of friendly nerds on the internet that are writing um, either interfaces between Python and other code that's already successful, which is one of my favorite things. So using Python can allow you to use a lot of other things. Um, uh, the, uh, so that XKCD that Thaddeus just shared, that uh, I actually meant to put into the next slide and I, or into the, this presentation and forgot to do it. I think I know exactly which one he's referring to. Um, it's an example of uh, how great Python is. But uh, anyway, so with open source modules, these are, are um, things that you can freely download. Um, and so open source often means free, usually means free. It also means that you can look at the code itself. So if you're having a hard time with something, you can read, once you've learned how to read code, you can read the code to say, what's going on here? Why don't I understand how this works? And so that can be really um, but the point is that there's a huge amount of work being done in Python um, that, uh, that you can take advantage of so that you don't have to learn all 12 languages. You really just, uh, it's a good place to start to just learn this one. Okay, so what's it like? What does it look like? In front of you, you should see two images. These are screen captures I took of online um, tools where you can just 
type in things in terms of these different languages and they will give you the output that is the result. On the left, you have Java. On the right, you have Python. Um, the reason that I decided to do this is I want you to see how visually Python looks compared to a lot of other languages. Now, on the left in Java, you can see uh, a lot of things have to be done just to print out four car names. On the right, you can see it's a lot shorter and that's really common. Python often assumes a lot of things which brings the problems that assumptions do, but also means that you can, there are times where I've seen comparisons and something that takes 300 lines in one language can be 30 lines in Python. So you can really see a big link factor. I, I did look a, a little of, um, I looked at a couple of websites that were talking about this. seems like a common line number change uh, or factor is about maybe a factor of five. So you can often write much, much shorter code. Um, and the other thing about it is, if, let's look on the left. So public class, my class. What you're doing is you have to answer the question, what am I doing? And you're making a class. That's why the word class is there. Uh, public means that this is a thing that other programs will be able to use. OK. Uh, and then um, I don't know why we needed to specify that, but we did. Uh, public static void static. I don't even remember. It's been so long. I've programmed in Java. I don't remember exactly what that means. Um, uh, uh, and then we, we have to create a main. We have to tell it that it's going to produce a string or do something with some strings. Uh, then when we create a variable called cars on that third line. So I'm looking at the third line on Java, that line of cars. We have to tell it that it's going to be a string and the brackets after it tell it that it's going to be a list of things or probably an array is the technical term. And then at the end of these lines, we need a semicolon to tell it that the line is over. Um, and then when we loop through, we uh, say, I need to loop over my cars uh, array here. I'm going to get a string out of it and I'm going to call that string I and then afterwards I'm going to tell the system to print the line of I. So the reason that it takes this much, I don't want to say that there are not good reasons for this. There are good reasons for this. I don't want to start a language fight. Um, but when you're learning, this is a lot to do just to print out some languages. And that's one of the th reasons I like Python. Um, on the right here, you'll see I'm going to make a variable called cars. I'm going to make a list of these four strings that label car names. And I'm going to store them in that list. I didn't have to tell it that they were strings. I didn't have to think about all of that. Um, I could just say, I have a variable. I'm making a list. I'm putting it in there. And then I really like the language on loops in Python for car in cars. You can make that a little longer to make it sound a little more uh, like English by saying, for, every, for each car in the list cars, print the car, OK? This left is exactly the same thing. It's just a little less English-like. So sometimes it's a little harder to think of. OK, so obviously, that's not teaching you how to use Python. That's just showing you what you can expect. And one of the reasons I like it is that it is easier to, uh, a little easier to read. There's just less visual noise. You don't have all these brackets and such. So it's a little cleaner to work with. Um, fewer brackets mean, and fewer end line character notes means fewer looking through 30 lines of code trying to figure out where you dropped a stupid semicolon um, because you didn't need semicolons in the first place. All right, I am gonna switch over now to more examples. I wanna show you, that's my email, where is my, oh, sorry for, being a little disorganized with this, I go to here. Um, <clears throat> uh, what you're seeing on the left here, and I'm gonna change my sharing really quickly just to share that window alone because I think that will be easier for everyone. Where'd it go? Ah, here it is. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. This is an interactive tool for Python called Jupyter, J-U-P-Y-T-E-R. Um, I'm going to double click on the Python here and I get a prompt. Now, 
this is an so um, Python is an interpreted language. That means that it goes through when you execute it, it goes through line by line. And that to me is really helpful for learning because I can then just type some specific things and get an immediate feedback response. I when I even when I'm doing complex programming, I'm constantly opening up Jupyter or IPython or something that allows me to get immediate feedback because then I can kind of play and say, wait, I don't remember how this object works. And then you can kind of just mess with it. So I want to show you, uh, and I'm going to copy over from this other thing. Let's see if I can manage to code while I'm talking. So uh, let's take a look at these four lines here. These are my setup today. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to import a module called AstroPy. I think you can imagine that that's probably a astronomical set, a set of astronomical tools for Python. Um, Bokeh uh, is a plotting tool. Um, I'll tell you about that in a moment. I'm just getting the things I need to use it. Uh, NumPy is a numerical calculation tool. I'm going to import that as well. So these things that I'm importing are modules. They are not code that I wrote. These are those open source modules that you've seen before. Output notebook, notebook is just an instruction that says that the output of Bokeh, I'm going to use it to do some graphs, is uh, going to um, come out to, uh, it's actually, it, I'm basically just saying you're working in a Jupyter notebook, so it knows that. I will execute this stuff. You can see that it spits out that the Bokeh thing loaded. What I want to do now, and I'm running short on time as expected, but what I want to do now is I'm just going to do a quick parabolic graph to show you how I would do that. Um, so to do that, I need to create a place to store my x, x values and my y values. I am going to then make a loop for i in np.a range. Uh, zero or yeah, zero through 10 uh, will take steps of point uh, one. Uh, let's see, let's hope I'm not screwing this up. Did I do this right? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, and then what we'll do is X, Y. So now what I wanna do is, so I've made a loop. So what I wanna do inside the loop what I want to do is I am going to, for every I, I'm going to add that to, I'm going to append uh, that value to my X. So my X's are going to be um, zero through 10. And then my Y's, I'm going to append I squared. So instead of the caret thingy, uh, the double star means squared, okay? So what did I get out of X? Did it work? Uh, yeah, that's a complicated list. You can see the brackets here indicate that it's a list. And then the commas break between each number in that list. And it's just wrapped around here. So we have X, so 0, 0.1, 0.2, all the way up to 9.9. .9. If I see what I got for Y, we get uh, as expected, we get all the way up to 9.9 uh, .9 squared, um, and that gives us that view. So now I want to plot that. So I'm going to make a figure with bokeh. I'm going to give it a title equals um, parabolic. Then I am going to p dot uh, line. So I'm going to print a line. Now, if you're wondering how do you know to do this? You learn to do this by reading the Bokeh documentation and then practicing. It's that simple. But the nice thing is you can do your practicing in an interactive thing like this, which is much easier than type, compile, read errors, type, compile, read errors. It's a little harder than that. Uh, OK, figure, title, parabolic, p dot line. Um, <clears throat> uh, I have to tell it what data that is, x equals my x, y equals y, uh, and then let's, oops, I forgot to show it, I have to tell it to show p, there we go, now I have a parabolic graph. Hopefully that line is thick enough that people can see it on the screen. Um, you can see that I can drag it and pan it around, bokeh is really nice like that, but of course it doesn't look like a pair of uh, parabolic if you just do the right side of it. So I'm going to go back up here and overwrite some of my things. 
So instead of starting at 10 or at zero, I'm gonna start at negative. I'm going to rerun this. That will verify that I've got more stuff. Now, if we run it again, now I get a traditional parabolic view. Okay, so um, Jupyter is a really nice tool. Uh, if you are familiar with things like LaTeX to do math, I will show you something very complex that I've done with it. I'm working on some educational tools for um, uh, quantum mechanics. And hopefully this will run correctly. Start with kernel. Ah, there you go. So um, <clears throat> these are instructions. These here are um, a markup language that allows me to do math really nicely. And then I can then actually show the student what calculations can be done with that math. Um, and so I've created a bunch of different things like this, and then these students could download these on their computer and play with them because it's all free and open source. They don't have to buy anything, which is nice, other than, you know, having a computer. Okay. Uh, I am almost out of time, so I'm going to run through my examples pretty quickly. Um, here are some notable um, uh, modules that you might be interested in. On the left is uh, for the interfaces, you can just execute it by typing Python and then your script on a terminal, and that will just run. Jupyter, I just showed you, IPython is kind of a non-graphical version of Jupyter. It's just text-based. Um, some, some nice science and math things are SciPy, which is a bunch of scientific analysis tools, NumPy, which is a bunch of computational tools, AstroPy, a bunch of ast astronomical tools. Um, SymPy is symbolic mathematics in Python. Um, and when I'm in, oh, you know what? I just realized probably what you're telling me is that I didn't switch my share. Sorry about that. Let's go back to sharing the desktop and we'll do that. Okay. Um, I can't see the chat window right now. So if there's anything, uh, yeah. Okay. I got it now. All right. So SymPy is symbolic mathematics. So if you're familiar with Mathematica, this is a free version of Mathematica. Um, Pandas is fancy tables. If you want to do visualization, there's Matplotlib, Bokeh, and YT. Matplotlib, I hate with a burning, hot, fiery passion, but everyone uses it because it's very well developed. Bokeh is relatively new. It needs some work, but I'm enjoying it because it's a lot simpler to work with. Um, Okay, here's an example of a video that I produced in part with Python. Uh, apparently YT, Ryan is saying that YT supports full gnome output, which is cool. I don't think I knew that. So you're probably not seeing much happen. This is a video that I produced by using Python to create data that I could in a format that I could load into digital sky and then I rendered out in a movie of it. If you're seeing little flickers on the screen, those are supernovae. So what I've done is I've taken all of the named supernovae since 1880 something and have uh, produced a video of our discovery of those. As we get better at discovering supernovae, you can see this reveal. And I can do this live and in 3D in my dome. This is just an example that I'm showing you. So nice visualization of how, um, how our detection rate for supernovae has changed over time. Okay, um, how did I do that? There is a nice database online that lists all the supernovae. Um, I'm going to delete some of that. I used Python and a couple of modules, uh, the astronomy one I mentioned earlier and beautiful soup to grab that data directly off of the web and then convert it nicely into a format that the uh, digital sky can load. Um, and the nice part is that I didn't have to worry about 
how, do I have to write all of the code to talk to the website and grab that data? No, Python already had something available. Um, I'm gonna skip this because I'm basically out of time. Um, another thing that might be int of interest to um, astronomy educators is Python has tools where you can actually use what's called the JPL spice kernel. That is um, how they, that is the detailed data that they use to measure the position of things or and to calculate the position of things moving through space. So when JPL plans missions to observe, they're using this stuff. Um, uh, but Python gives you a very easy interface to ac access that really complex data. But you do have to do some reading on how Spice kernels work, but there's some nice tools uh, publicly available for that. So I used JPL's FM, uh, which is a Python module. I use AstroPy. Again, you'll see I use that a lot. I wrote my own thing to generate um, some potential, uh, the gravitational potential based on the position of those objects and then use pill to image that. Uh, it looks like I didn't get around to showing you the image, but that's okay, because uh, I am out of time. Why do I like Python? It is actively developed, it is easy to read, it has what's called a batteries included philosophy, which um, means that they take it on them to do things for you, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel every five minutes. Um, <clears throat> uh, it is multi-platform, you can write once, but you can run everywhere. Uh, it is an interpreted language, which gives you that feedback, which is so powerful for learning. It has dynamic typing. That's just a personal favorite of mine. That means you don't have to declare what you're going to do and then do it. You just do it. Um, and in particular, I find screens and text uh, are much easier to work with than other languages. How do you get started? Please feel free to ask me. Um, uh, I'm always happy to help. Uh, I encourage you to find a tutorial. A lot of people like to pick a task and say, I'm going to use, I'm going to learn how to use Python to do X. That's sometimes it's very hard when you don't know how things work to figure out what's going to be a hard project or an easy project. So I think starting with a, a tutorial first is better. Um, pick a small task, make it work. Uh, consider working with something like Jupyter because it's nice and pretty. Um, I like a tool or a, a website called Learn Python the hard way. I think it's a great way of learning. W3 schools, I haven't used it for Python. It's an online web thing you can use. It will take you through how to learn. Um, and also, I think it's important to acknowledge the time it will take. Um, and, and I'm not saying don't start because it's going to take forever. I'm saying give yourself permission for it to take forever. <laughs> and I don't mean forever. I just mean really make it, if you really want to learn how to use a programming language, any programming language, really take it that that's a new skill that you're going to have to learn. And like any skill, even though it starts easy, to get to the point of being able to do something that you really find valuable can actually take a lot of time. So, um, oh, was I allowed to go till noon instead of till 11.48? You are. Oh, well, good. I rushed uh, and got myself done with plenty of time for questions. Since I do have a little more time, let me show you that image that I produced. Um, let me show you real quick. I know you're seeing lots of my desktop here. Uh, I want to show you what I was doing with that other example. Um, if I go to, uh, and people can type questions or ask questions while I'm doing this. So uh, what you're seeing on your screen to the left there, this is what I was able to produce um, using uh, Python. So the little dots that you're seeing are the sun and the planets in a particular date. Um, and what I've done is I've given them a brightness value based on the strength of their gravity. You can see now really the sun should be outshining everything, but I've done some scaling to make the other objects uh, uh, visible. So you can see that Jupiter here, of course, dominates the Jupiter and the sun dominate the system. But I think this is just a really pretty one. There's one more. Can't find the actual one I wanted to show you. I have the Lagrange points that I did as well. Uh, where is that? I had it earlier. Oh, well, 
Um, I'll open it up for questions since I kind of ran through uh, at the last minute. So somebody's saying, Eric is saying the supernovae um, list isn't being kept up to date anymore. Supernova reporting was taken away from Harvard a few years ago. Okay, good to know. I haven't checked on it in a while and I, and I should run it again and see if there's another source for that. Um, uh, Mark Webb asks, have you used Python to create an audience interactive? I have not. I am working on that now. Um, one of the things that I'm doing with the downtime, since uh, uh, people are not able to come to my facility, is I'm trying to produce some interactive things, not anything that they would use uh, uh, at my facility in person, but largely I'm thinking of my students. Uh, so, um, and I'm doing that with Poke. And the reason I'm doing that with Poke is because it's designed to do that in a way that like Matplotlib isn't. Um, so my path for that is, uh, I have uh, asked our engineering science computing to set me up a server. That server will be a place where I can put the output of Bokeh. Uh, and Bokeh actually has a little server on it that is intended to allow people to go on and have widgets that they can click and drag and do things with. Um, in hopefully a few weeks, I will have an example that I can show all of you. So Mark, I will have an example of that to do. Uh, so I think I know how to do it, um, but I haven't done it yet. And any other questions for Keith this morning? All right, Keith, if that's it, then uh, yo, um, if you wouldn't mind putting your contact information and uh, maybe the, the how to get started slide would be fantastic. Um, if Keith, you can put that in the e-conference uh, event page, that'd be fantastic. Okay. Uh, we'll so do. that people can get, get in contact with you. I'll go ahead and drop my email address in the chat right now. Great. Oh. I did that privately. <laughs> I always do that. Um, I will say, if I can for a minute, since we've got a little more time, uh, yes, I can share, Amy, I can share that supernova video with you. Um, <clears throat> the uh, Actually, one more thing. I have written some of the tools that I have written, I am in the process of documenting so that I can share them with you. So uh, most of the tools I'm working with are to use Python to create text-based data in a party view format, because that's something that, uh, for various reasons, it's very easy to load that into Digital Sky, which is what I work with. I think some of the other systems can load party view format as well. I know we should be moving away with it or from that, but it's what I have. So I am currently working with one of my students to document that material and share it so that it's easy, uh, might be an easy place for you to get started if you want to produce some data, if you happen to have Digital Sky. Um, one thing I do want to say, I think it's very common for people that don't have digital systems to think that, um, uh, how, you know, what can I do with this? Because um, I can't, you know, I don't have a computer system a digital system that I can display this stuff on. I hope that you have set up um, a way of at least having a projector project on your dome. I know that's pretty common. So hopefully if you have that, I think it's really important to understand that taking control of the way that data is, is shown to your audience can be a really powerful way of, of really nailing down exactly what you want to show them. So if you can produce just an image and then display it via a normal projector, uh, either before a dark sky show or after, obviously you might have um, dark adaptation issues with that. Um, we've I did that in my very first dome at Clemson and it was a really nice way to both show the motion of the sky with our Spitz system, but also to um, uh, be able to project live, or not live, but to project updated, you know, the kids love to see pictures of um, the planets. You can do that. Obviously if you have slides, you could do that too but I think that a digital projector is a good way to do that just somewhere on your dome. Um, we were able to make that work when we didn't have a digital system. And I think you could use these computing skills to produce the images that you want to produce. 
Sean is asking, could I share DS bits in the forum? Uh, yes, I will see if I can get a student on that. <laughs> I'm a little, uh, I, th I think definitely would like to do that. Um, and that'll be part of what we're gonna do. Uh, oh, um, Mark, this is Mark Subaru. I see that you're here as well. One of the things that was brought up at the last data to dome lips last year was the possibility of having um, mentors on computing. Um, and I think a mentor program is something that I'd like to be involved with. If that's something that you think that you could benefit from, uh, let some of the leadership in IPS and in CLEPA and in your regionals know that that might be something that we would, you would find useful. So, uh, okay, I'll shut up now. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Keith. Uh, and then uh, just as you were, you were finishing up, uh, Cairo said, is anyone planning a Python tutorial for beginners? Uh, it was one of the things that Keith and I discussed at uh, the very, very beginning of the e-conference, sort of in the in the, the the green room, if you will, um, that if there is enough uh, interest, we can certainly do a special event uh, where it would be outside of the standard e-conference schedule and have it where there'll be, you know, a syllabus and, and what you can download and, and having things set aside ahead of time so that once you're into that that tutorial you can jump right in and have uh pretty much one for one what keith would be doing on a screen what's happening on your own computer so that way we can uh we can do that so if you're interested in it uh let us know either in the chat or in dome dialogues directly and we'll uh we'll see if we can't put something like that together uh in the very very near future uh let me get somebody admitted real quick uh so now we're gonna uh switch well we're gonna switch uh, uh directions a little bit uh mark Subarau is here uh with us this morning uh mark of course is currently the president of ips uh and is chair of the COVID 19 task force uh, that I and a few other people in the room happen to be uh, members of as well. Uh, there was a survey that was put out to the planetarium community. There were more than 250 responses uh, to the survey and really wanted to get a sense of how COVID-19 has affected planetarium facilities around the world, uh, what is similar between sites, what's different between sites, and most importantly, what planetarians want in these coming months uh, to help support their uh, uh, their endeavor. So, uh, Mark, I'm going to turn it over to you. Give us a, a brief update on that and a little bit of a synopsis of the, the survey results. All right. Uh, thanks, thanks, Michael. Um, and happy birthday, everyone. To the warning strikes behind me. Um, anyway, uh, um, what I'd like to do is just uh, to give you sort of a very brief, we'll take like 10 minutes, um, overview of some of the actions we've taken so far, um, and also um, how uh, you can help us sort of guide some of the questions in the future. So I'm going to share a little presentation. Um, okay. All right, we good? So um, as you know, uh, we we were planning to have this year's conference in Edmonton um, this summer. We made an early call to um, to postpone the conference. Um, uh, you're going to get an update um, in, in the next day or two about where that stands. But I thought I could give you maybe let you know ahead of time if everybody promises to quiet. Can you can all keep a secret? Yes? All right. Um, yeah, so it, unfortunately it looks like we're not going to be able to reschedule. This. So um, in, in the next day or two, we'll send out an email announcing that um, the in-person uh, conference in uh, Edmonton will be canceled. Uh, we are, we are going to plan for a virtual um, substitute for that conference. Um, the details of that are still being worked out, but we have some um, really exciting ideas for how that's going to play out. I think, actually, I think the success of um, these e-conferences has shown um, that this can be a pretty uh, effective environment and um, uh, we're going to try to do something a little bit more unique than just um, you know a series of, of lectures virtual lectures we're going to 
we're going to try to have a pretty unique format. So I think stay tuned, um, but we're excited at least about how that's proceeding. Um, um, one of the other things that we did early on was that we um, we made um, our journal open access for just to support all the planetariums around the world. So um, I would encourage you to take advantage of that. Uh, I'm hoping everybody's an IBS member, but um, your colleagues may not be, and, and let them know that they all have access to that uh, as well. Um, and uh, another communication um, mechanism that we have now is our monthly newsletter. And if you saw the last issue, that's um, a lot of the focus there is on COVID-19 related um, items. Um, in particular, one thing I think um, that I just want to highlight from the last newsletter that I think might be worth having someone present from, maybe someone from the Frost Planetarium is this, um, something that's been happening with um, converting pl your planetarium servers to run uh, this um, distributed computing platform to uh, participate in the Rosetta at Home project. Um, so there are at least five planetariums I know um, participating in this and um, some of us are like among the top participants already because our, our systems are actually pretty powerful. So. Um, there's a pretty nice story about there about a group of planetariums coming together and contributing to um, uh, COVID-19 related research with their planetarium systems. Ah, but what I was supposed to talk about was the task force. So um, we created this task force. It has uh, 21 members. A lot of people have uh, experience with the organization uh, and conferences. Um, it contains all of the what will be our new representation um, um, at, um, after this summer of the which is a regional base with continental zones and all of those uh, representatives of each of the continental zones is part of this task force. Um, the first thing we did was uh, to try to get a, a sense of the situation planetariums were in. Um, and that was a survey. Thank you, um, all of you who filled out that survey. Um, we got a really great response, um, mostly from IPS members, but you see there was 250 responses, um, a, a decent number of non-members as well. Oh wait, that's not my slide show. Oh, all right. That slide on. I, I'll save that fact for later. So, the um, uh, regional Reno mostly dominated by North America and Europe. Um, if you look at that chart, we actually got, given the size of our organization, the number of planetariums, pretty good representation from uh, Latin America. Um, but, but Asia um, uh, was underrepresented in this survey, given the number of planetariums. Um, we also had a pretty good uh, breakdown of different types of facilities. So, uh, where did this stand? So, this survey went out on April 1st. Um, almost all the results came back within the next couple of days, um, which is relatively early after most of the shutdown orders. So, uh, we're seeing a, a snapshot of um, a pretty early time. We're going to try to issue an, um, a follow-up survey around March 1st, which will give us like one month in the future. Um, when we asked the questions, we asked people to um, state what the current situation was, but also project um, what they saw the impact to be in the future. So um, I think um, as you, uh, maybe not. Um, one thing that we saw is almost everybody had already closed down. Um, there are only three planetariums out of the 250 responses that where people reported a planetarium being open. Um, of those, 60% of uh, people weren't able to even access their facility. Um, already two weeks in, 11% um, 
um, of the facilities reported having uh, lost staff already. Um, obviously, there's a huge financial impact. I think the interesting ones there are people's ability to make purchases this year. And, um, and I think we saw a pretty significant fraction um, of of facilities in the K may be unable to purchase content or make um, make um, equipment upgrades. So this is um, a much fuller um, report on this um, is available, and I'll, I'll, I'll let you know how to get that in a little bit. And then the other question was, um, how can the IPS support you during this time? And the results here are interesting. Um, in the sense that I think it really um, is a reflection of this like dramatic migration everybody's had like into the, the digital sphere and producing online content and overnight um, we're asked to be experts in this new medium. Um, and so um, the, the results that got the highest responses um, were ones about uh, training to uh, to create content in the sphere. Um, uh, in fact, the, so the partnerships was actually specifically, I think, mentioning these conferences as well, partnering with this, uh, training webinars, online content best practices. Um, some of them are more material things, so we floated the idea of uh, providing some small grants during this time. The reality is that would be a very small amount of money, but it could be helpful to start up small programs, but it didn't score that well um, compared to the trading things. Um, and I think in some cases we have already been asked to write letters of support. Um, we did that uh, for the Italian planetariums and the funding request they had in government and that of course is another service that may become useful, especially um, as people start applying um, for financial relief. Um, Last week, um, um, uh, Mike Murray gave a report about um, this uh, new planetary network that we opened up um, um, to, to facilitate communication during the film. We gave an early release of that. Uh, one of the things, let me see if I'm um, trying to manage all my windows, uh, but if I can. I will add to the chat later as soon as I find the window a, a link if you haven't joined already. But on that site, um, one of the features that we, there's a fuller write up of this report that I gave you, with, uh, especially including some of the pre response answers. So I encourage you to check that out. And if you haven't signed up already, please do so. We're getting a decent amount of activity. Um, you see, people are starting to add their online streaming events as well. So that's going well. Um, and then one last thing, just wanted to close by apologizing. My, uh, I was the result of a phishing attack earlier this week. Did anybody get a weird email from me early on Monday or Sunday? Well, there were a few of these that went out. And I did not, I'm not requesting money for planetary medical supplies. If you got an email, it's a fake. It wasn't really for me. Um, Unfortunately, one of the things I think having an email address that has the word president in it makes you pretty prone to these um, kinds of phishing attacks. But it's happened to us a couple of times. But as always, be careful um, uh, with these kinds of things. I apologize if, if you, you got that in your email. Uh, all right, thank, thanks for, thank you very much. I apologize, Michael. I know I was supposed to do this last week and I didn't show up, but um, I'm glad you gave me a second chance. Uh, well, thanks for, for, for being here today, Mark, and for the information. So, of course, if you, uh, you know, if you have any more, you know, any additional concerns, uh, feel free to reach out to Mark to the IPS board and, and uh, you know, kind of make sure that this, with the next round of surveys coming out, uh, to have these checkpoints, these waypoints that we can look to and have a, a real solid idea of what's happening in the planetarium community. Uh, so now we're moving on to our second half of the session, which means we get to all of our, our favorite segments. Uh, first one off today uh, for the second time. You loved it last week. You're going to love it more this week. Uh, all the way from Berlin, Germany, 
Anna Green's long German words of the week. Yay! Seid ihr bereit? Are you ready? <laughs> All right, so if you weren't with us last week, um, I mercilessly stole this from Christoph Waltz when he was on the Jimmy Fallon show. Uh, so you are going to get three progressively longer and longer German words, and you will be given two choices of what they might mean. And you will be given a poll, and you get to vote on which one you think is correct. So, uh, Michael, can you pop up the first word, please? All right, word one, popping up. Word number one, die Schwerlosigkeit. Die Schwerlosigkeit. Is it A, friction, or B, gravity? Lock in your votes. I watched way too many Nickelodeon game shows as a kid. <laughs> About 70%. Oh, this is a tight one. This is neck and neck. If you're just sitting there wanting to commit to one, just commit to one. It's okay. No one knows that you're wrong except for me and Anna. Because we see like, everybody's name and you're yeah. wrong. No, we, no, no, it's all—it's completely anonymous. <laughs> I was gonna say, if anybody can, it's only Michael. So we've got most of our votes in. I'm gonna end polling on this one. Um, Forty-six percent say friction. Fifty-four percent say gravity. Otto, what is the correct answer? So I realized last week I didn't break down the words. Um, so long German words are typically at least one usually two to several words all shoved together into one word. So I'm going to break the words down for you because usually their literal translation is just chef's kiss. Um, so this one is heavy. And I've seen uh, sometimes translated as looseness. Um, sometimes it's just kind of a, a word you, or letters you smack on the end of schwer. Uh, it is gravity. Yay, I'm seeing a bunch of hands going up. Yay, good job. All right, word number two. Okay, here it comes. And, and this is a good one. The word three is crazier, but this is a good one too. There we go. Okay, so, das Kassenlaufbahn war ein Trendings. Das Kassenlaufbahn war ein Trendings. Is it A, the conveyor belt divider at the checkout at the store? Or B, the chip reading credit card machine at the checkout at the store. Looks like we've got a uh, decidedly one sided here. It's All right, it's not even going to be close. We got we have almost everybody in. Uh, about three quarters say it's the conveyor belt divider at the checkout of the store. The other quarter say the chip reading credit card machine at the checkout of the store. Anna, what is the correct answer? Uh, this word breaks down into uh, casa or kassen, which is um, the checkout. Laufband, which literally translates as treadmill. Uh, so the belt. Uh, conveyor belt, that's what we say in English. Uh, Waren, goods, tren, divide, dings, thing. So it is literally the checkout, treadmill, good dividing thing. So it is A. Good job, guys. Well, it never. it's never a conveyor belt. It's now a, a goods treadmill from now on. Yes. And then last but not least, word number three. Uh, and Anna let us know that this came from John Elvert. Um, so this is a particularly, a, this is a crowdsourced one. Here we go. All right, this is der Eisenbahnschwellenunterführungsbeamter. Der Eisenbahnschwellenunterführungsbeamter. Is it A, the tool used to fill pastries with custard, cream, or jam? Or B, the officer in charge of the filling under railroad ties? 
kind of want a Berliner now. Oh, it's almost exactly 50-50. That's how you know. Sorry, Keith. If it makes you feel better, I, I did. I taught high school French for a very, very brief period of time. And usually what I get when I meet people is, yeah, I had four years of French in high school and I remember how to say hello and that's it. So <laughs> when you don't use it, you lose it. <laughs> and also you probably didn't have these words in textbooks. All right, so we've got we've got almost everybody in. About ninety percent of the votes are in. Uh, Fifty-five percent say it's a tool used to fill pastries with custard, cream, or jam, and uh, the other forty-five percent said the officer in charge of the filling under railroad ties. Otto, what is the correct answer? So this word breaks down into Eisenbahn. Eisen is iron. Bahn is train. Schwellen uh, is uh, railroad ties. Unterfüllungs is uh, underfilling and Beamter is officer. So it is the officer in charge of the filling that is under railroad ties. And Mark Webb is so incredibly happy right now. It's, uh, <laughs> I, I hope you can all see that in the gallery view. Um, so <laughs> those are your three long German words of the week. Anna, is there a word for the instrument that fills up pastries with custard, cream, or jam? I mean, probably. Okay, so it's an actual thing, yeah. Um, I, I mean, there's got to be. Sometimes, though, they don't always shove all the words together, and they put a hyphen in between some of them. And I'm still trying to figure out when that happens and when you just shove the words together and when you stick an S or an N in between some of the words in the middle of the word. It's it's fun. And if you ask, if you ask a native speaker um, when those things happen, They'll just tell you, oh, well, they just do. So, <laughs> but I will find out for you all for next week if there is an officially long word for a tool used to fill pastries with custard cream or jam. I'm just saying after last week's video of the poached egg tool, we it just whet the appetite for, for future um, culinary related words. Cool. Yeah, all right, I'm so... I realized two weeks in a row I gave food related options for word three. <laughs> all right, quick show of hands. How many of you were able to get all three correct this morning, evening, afternoon? So, okay, just a few. Well, congratulations. Congratulations. Um, so thank you, Anna. Uh, Anna will be with us uh, next week again, but on Friday we'll go over why she will not be here on Wednesday. It'll be a Friday next week um, at the end of the, the e conference. Uh, briefly, uh, before we move. Sorry, um, just real quick. Amy asked um, if people make up German words to fit their needs. Uh, yes, yes, they do. Uh, that is definitely a thing that that happens. Um, but I feel like whenever I try to do that, I'm told I know what you're trying to say, but you can't do that. Um, but then if I ask what it is, it's exactly what I would have thought it was and usually involves words that are cognates with English. Murphy's Law. There you go. There you go. All right. So before we move on to Totally Bored uh, with Justin Bartle, um, a quick aside, I'm going to turn it over to Paulette Epstein um, about, uh, you also see this in the chat, Mark Webb had posted it, um, some opportunities that were available through ASTC, uh, specifically having to do with the National Endowment for the Humanities here in the United States. Uh, yeah. So, um, there, there are opportunities that ASTC has been posting on their website, even if you are not a, an AST, ASTC museum, even if you are not a, an AAM museum um, or a museum in general, I really encourage everybody to follow them on social media. ASTC has been posting lots of different funding opportunities, uh, specifically uh, for here in the United States, um, but a lot of the museums and planetariums in the United States are privately funded. Um, so I know a lot of us are having a lot of issues right now trying to 
find funding to get us through the rest of the year and, and beyond. Um, so definitely check out those opportunities. Um, I'll be posting anything that I, I see from ASTC that is funding related that might be good for the planetarium community on Dome Dialogues. Um, so keep an eye out for that kind of stuff, but definitely look into that stuff. Um, that money will go very quickly. So look into it um, as quick as you can. Thank you, thank you Paulette. Uh, all right, so we're moving on to our next segment. This is Totally Bored with Justin Bartle of the Science Museum of Virginia. Justin, take it away. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm loving these multiple choice foreign language questions. I'm also in the boat where I had four years of German in high school, but it's serving me just well enough. Uh, I didn't have to take any in college because I aced a multiple choice test uh, before going to college. So, uh, all right, uh, back to uh, board games. Uh, just a couple of, of notes for you uh, for this week's segment have uh, maybe three things to take you through. First, uh, follow up to last week. Now I have actually played the expansion to Planetarium, at least part of it. Uh, it uh, adds two new elements to the game and one of them seemed kind of complicated. So we haven't done that just yet. Uh, we are now playing with the frost line in the game. That's going pretty well. It adds a bit of extra bookkeeping for you to keep track of while you're playing. Uh, and with just two of us, uh, we've mostly avoided conflict by just kind of each of us adopting a planet and uh, ushering that through its, its evolution in the game. It's working really great. Uh, we'll probably add the uh, late heavy bombardment in before too long. Uh, but got to bring some new content for you too. So uh, let's see what else we have on the game shelf. Um, Ah, well, I suggested maybe we try something brand new uh, last night, but we opted not to. Um, uh, what I would have done is uh, Seven Wonders, which if you really know your uh, show producer's back catalog, that is totally planetarium related somehow. Uh, but uh, I figured there's probably something else available here. Uh, you know, who, who here has uh, done a planetarium show without... I don't know, some kind of light bulb involved, uh, some kind of electricity. So even though it's not strictly astronomical, uh, another game that uh, we visited multiple times during our uh, time at home, a uh, nice little two player edition of a, a game called Tesla versus Edison. So there is a nice big fully featured version of this game that can support up to five players, I believe it is, if you're uh, locked up with the group. Uh, but this is specifically designed for, uh, for two people. So this is working pretty well for us. As the name suggests, you get to uh, choose a side. So uh, you've got Thomas Edison, you've got Nikola Tesla, and this dual version is really basically a, uh, a card collecting game, although uh, there's a lot going on. Uh, you have your main inventor, of course, and then there are technologies that your inventor uh, gets to control. And uh, then you've got assistants. Now those assistants give you additional actions you get to take every turn. Uh, you might get to steal technology from your competitor. Can't think of anybody that might have done that. Um, you get to, uh, Electrify cities, bring either alternating current or direct current to various cities in, uh, in different regions. Uh, then there is a stock market you can use to uh, rack up some extra points. Uh, and of course, the propaganda track, which you can use to uh, shut out your opponent. I don't know who would have been really good at that. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the game has been really fun for us. We've played a couple of times. Kind of want to get into the fully featured version of it. Uh, um, but uh, that, uh, again, another big task. It's not like we don't have the time. Uh, so, uh, so maybe we'll have even more Tesla versus Edison in the future. Uh, speaking of the future, of course, there are always more games around. And uh, I got a tip after last week's segment uh, about uh, another game that's already out there called Stellar. Might, might, might give that a shot. Uh, but as I was researching it, I realized, oh, I've already got a game on the way by the same designers. Uh, as I mentioned last week, a lot of these are Kickstarter purchases for me. And one campaign that wrapped, out, wrapped up long enough ago that 
may actually arrive in the next few weeks is oh, I'm on the wrong side of that one. Uh, it's called The Search for Planet X. So uh, there's a brand new game that is taking the uh, uh, the search for Planet X, or uh, you may also know it as Planet Nine, and, and some of the uh, the more recent theories. Uh, you will get to control these giant telescopes, conduct. Uh, and uh, search campaigns, try and locate the planet. The game only ends if somebody does find it. Uh, this is a Kickstarter campaign. The, uh, the last update we got is that the games were produced. They were shipping to the U.S. Uh, for those of us in North America. Um, but uh, unfortunately, the warehouse uh, that uh, was receiving them was shut down. So whether they will move any farther is uncertain. Uh, so I'll know more in a, a couple weeks. Stay tuned. Might have the search for planet X for you. Uh, in the meantime, if you've got any other suggestions uh, or questions, feel free to, to send them my way. Awesome. Well, thank you, Justin, as always. Uh, so we'll see sort of, um, Justin will be one of the segments that kind of drops in and out as, as board games and other things become available. Uh, so, you know, Justin's not on the, the hook for three board games a week for the next however many weeks we're going to do this. Um, next up, uh, all the way from San Francisco and the California Academy of Sciences, it's Mary Holt's Pandemic Primo podcast for your planetarian. Mary, she's in the room. Excellent. Mary, take it away. Yes, I am here. Uh, also, you say that name better than I do. <laughs> well done. I have uh, decided to shorten it to PPP PFP for myself because that's easier for, for me to say. So feel free to latch on to that if you so choose. Uh, but here, let me share my screen real quick. Do, do, do. There we go. All right, so, um, oh, I always forget where we want to be able to see all of you. There we go. Ah, lovely. All right, so welcome to episode three of PPP PFP. Glad you're all joining me today. Today's episode is brought to you by, um, uh, Earth Day, and as always, Squarespace. Now, when I was trying to pick out specific episodes for Earth Day, I had a little bit of an existential crisis because I was like, how does one even do that? Earth Day could encompass so many things. Uh, what do I, how do I even begin with this? But Shortwave gave me a nice place to start today. And the fact that they have an episode that just launched yesterday, specifically about Earth Day. So you could start there with a nice short episode all about uh, this wonderful day that we have today. And then uh, as I was thinking about Earth Day, some very important and relevant topics, but also sad topics came to mind, things like climate change and whatnot, but we're all here to spread science education. So these are things we should uh, think about and be aware of, of course, but also uh, the Google <laughs> Doodle also reminded me of bees. So the next one is about bees. Uh, this Science Versus episode is all about um, how bees are being affected partly by climate change and also uh, just what's going on with them not doing so well in the last few years. And a couple other ones I thought of uh, recently, uh, one of the latest invisibilia is not too much focused on things I would say are Earth Day or science, but it is all about sound and a big portion of it is about sound in nature and how that changes as certain um, areas or climates are affected uh, over time and you get fewer uh, animals and wildlife in an area and how drastically that can change uh, what you hear over time. And it was really good. And there's a brief mention of the California Academy of Sciences in this episode too. So of course I had to rip that one as well. Um, and then kind of continuing along a similar-ish vein. Uh, I looked through 99% Invisible, which just in general is a wonderful podcast. Pretty much any episode you could listen to is great. So I recommend looking that up just in general. Um, but this one from a couple of years ago about the wildfires um, in California specifically, but that can apply I'm sure to other places around the world as well. And which is another, sorry, I got real sad this morning. I didn't intend for that to happen when I started this, but <laughs> this fire season's coming up soon. So that, that's a thing. Um, and then a couple of specific to climate change podcasts uh, within the last several years, my sister suggested this one from This American Life 
which is actually from seven years ago. So I kind of want to go and listen to it again and see how things have changed uh, since that episode came out. And then one from just a couple of years ago that's kind of about the uh, political history surrounding climate change in the United States. And lastly, for something a little more lighthearted nature that we all may have in our kitchens, fruit flies. Why, why, why fruit flies? Why are there billions of them sometimes? How does that happen? That's what this episode is all about. Um, and that is what I will leave you with, a slightly more lighthearted nature thing that we can maybe find in our own homes as we're stuck here. So thank you all for joining me again today. Hey, thank you, Mary. So again, that's the, uh... Uh, I'm going to read it again. The PPPP, the Pandemic Primo Podcast Party for Your Planetarian. Thank you, Mary, uh, from Cal Academy. And now, um, since we're a little ahead of schedule, it works out pretty well, uh, we're going to try something brand new. We're going on a digital field trip today. And um, I'm going to be controlling our, our field trip, uh, but not doing much of the presenting. That's actually going to fall uh, to Chris Isidore. Um, this is her segment. It's called Crossing Over. Um, has nothing to do with astrology or the dead or anything like that. Um, it's just a play on her name. Uh, we tried Carissa Explains It All, but that was just too easy. Um, so what makes this a unique one is that I'm actually going to be changing my video. And you're going to want to pin or spotlight my video. And the way to do that is that if you're in the big gallery view, you go to the upper right-hand corner of my uh, my. Uh, little video area, click the three little button, three little dot button, uh, and you'll see either pin or spotlight. Uh, that means that you'll see my video while other people are talking over it because we're taking you into the digital world of Animal Crossing. Here we go. Oh boy, here we are. Well, here's Michael. Hi here everyone, I'm Carissa. Um, I've probably met most of you. Um, and if I haven't met you, I'm really excited that this is your first impression of me playing this video game. Um, but it's going to be really fun, I think. Uh, so if you are not familiar with Animal Crossing yet, it is a game that just came out, um, well, the newest version just came out on March 20th, which happens to be kind of the best timing for it, I guess, because everyone is at home and everyone is playing it. Uh, so if you haven't played it, you've probably heard of someone else playing it. Uh, it is a social simulator, so a lot of it is kind of just talking to the, to the different creatures that live on your island. Um, but another big component of it is collecting, uh, specifically to donate things to the museum, which has a huge collection of like bugs and fish and fossils. Um, and they're awesome and all based on real life things. Uh, but there's also a big astronomy component to the game as well. Uh, their characters can watch meteor showers at night sometimes and collect different things. So I have collected quite a few things. Um, I have a few things being lent to me by friends. And I'm going to, oh, where are my, where is everyone? Oh, there you are. <laughs> uh, I need to, um, hold on a second. I need to, I need to get changed so that I'm appropriate for this into my, there we go. So now I'm a museum professional. Um, oh, beautiful. I wonder who that is. Uh, so we'll take you all to our museum today. Um, this is actually where I have my museum right here. Uh, but this is not where the space items are because they don't have a planetarium in this museum, which I'm writing to Nintendo to complain about pretty much every day. Uh, and until they meet my demands, I have built my own, <laughs> my own little space corner. Uh, so, everyone can follow the hot dog up to the space corner. Uh, and again, if you have not pinned Michael's video, please do so because otherwise you're missing out on all of the fun. Uh, and you're only seeing my face, which there's not much to look at right now. Uh, so, here we are, a few different items that they have in the game. It's been really cool to see all of the real life things that they've pulled into it. Um, so I have a few things here that I wanted to talk about. Uh, there's, <laughs> everyone is very excited. Uh, <laughs> so there is an asteroid model right here, which you can tell by its cratered exterior. It is 
meant to model an asteroid, uh, but I thought it reminded me a lot of the meteorites uh, fragment that we have in the planetarium lobby at the Science Center. Um, and our meteorite fragment is about 750 pounds. It's a fragment of the uh, meteor from the meteor crater in Arizona, um, and which maybe a lot of you are familiar with. Probably most of you have been there. I have not yet myself, but someday. Uh, but it reminded me a lot of that. And it looks kind of similar scale in game to uh, our meteorite that I'm very familiar with. Um, I always have fun telling our guests that our meteorite is not bolted down to the table. It's just sitting on top of the table. And they always get very amazed by that, that they could just walk away with it if they could lift it. But fortunately, it's extremely heavy. <laughs> uh, this is so absurd. I hope everyone is enjoying this. Um, so here we can see a, uh, of the lunar module right here uh, as seen in the Apollo missions. Thank you for pushing me, Michael. <laughs> uh, this is an example of the module that the astronauts uh, would work from as they were landed on the moon. And uh, this is actually on loan from another museum. Uh, so thank you to Paulette for for loaning me this piece uh, for our, our job today. Uh, if we can make our way back along the path here, we can visit the uh, command and service module, the CSM, which uh, right here, very excited about this one as well. So the CSM uh, is meant to hold about three crew and uh, the we can see the engine right now is actually working, which I was really excited to find out. About uh, 20,000, just over 20,000 pounds of thrust from this engine right here, which is very good. And uh, my favorite part of this, it has a lot of detail from the real, like from the actual um, CSM. And you can even see the little uh, reaction control system that it has. So little thrusters all around the different sides that would help it uh, maneuver through space. Uh, we also have a lunar rover right here. One of the lunar rovers uh, that were used in the last three Apollo missions. So Apollo 15, 16, and 17 all had one of these with them. Uh, they had a top speed of about eight miles per hour, but of course, uh, astronaut, oh, someone else is joining us. I wonder who's coming. Uh, so they had a top speed of about eight miles per hour, but of course that land speed, uh, lunar land speed record was actually made by an astronaut, Gene Cernan, who went 11 miles per hour, so. Of course, we didn't plan for anybody to enter the island while we were giving this presentation. I felt it was uh, appropriate to give people the full experience of what it's like <laughs> to play Animal Crossing. <laughs> oh, Mary, I'm assuming you're joining us. Oh, uh, but Mary, it takes forever for you to fly into our deserted island. <laughs> the infinite load screen. So this is the load screen that we all get to watch. It's very realistic. As you can see, you get to impatiently wait for your friends to join you. Uh, as, as flights are often delayed, um, but it's, and you know, if you're trying to have. wish on shooting stars to get star pieces to build your spacecraft and somebody decides to come in to catch them with you, they prevent you from wishing and getting your star pieces. <laughs> it's a tough world. It's a it tough really virtual is. world. It really yeah. sounds like a cult, but it's for the greater good. <laughs> First world problems. It's really, it's really wonderful. Uh, it's really fun because the the astronomy stuff has always been kind of a part of this game, and it seems like with this one, uh, there have been other games throughout the years in the past, but this is the most recent one. Um, and it seems like they really kind of amped up the real world inclusions from it, like the actual models of different spacecraft that they have. So. Um, I think one of the last ones I want to look at right now is, of course, the Saturn V. So here we have a model of the Saturn V, uh, which is always exciting to see, especially considering now we are working our way through 50th anniversaries. Of course, most recently Apollo 13 
Um, so it's always fun to see these in game as well. I wish I could make it launch, but alas, I cannot. Um, I also have a real to real player to include because I'm a planetarian. So uh, I couldn't find, unfortunately, I couldn't find a baby food jar to put in here, but someday, maybe, maybe there will be one. <laughs> So we have some questions from the chat. Oh, yeah. Uh, Paige would like to know, can you explain the basics of Animal Crossing? Uh, yes. Uh, so, and is this an interactive online game? Yes. Uh, yeah, so Animal Crossing is technically what's known as a, uh, a, a simulator, a life simulator, or a social simulator. So kind of like The Sims, um, if you've ever played The Sims before. Basically, you you get an island uh, in this in this particular game. You get an island and you get to develop it. So you get to build your house and you get to decorate and you get to donate things to a museum. So a lot of the game is centered on collecting things and donating them to uh, the museum. And they are all real objects uh, that exist in, in the real world. So. Um, there's, there's a bunch of fossils. It's a really well-designed museum too. Um, and you can play it interactively online. So as you can see right now, I am playing it with a few, <laughs> a few friends who are rapidly changing their clothes. Um, we're actually viewing it right through Michael's game. So we are all connected online. Um, it's been a really fun way to, to stay connected with people, especially right now, because uh, this is as much of kind of exploring the outdoors as I'm able to do in the world right now. Uh, so it's been a kind of fun conduit for that. Is there? Yes. Yep. Online. Interaction. Yeah, you're, you're, you're all hitting me. So I guess that means you've, you've hit your, your peak. <laughs> uh, look at that. There we go. Uh, but yeah, so it is a, it is kind of an awesome a uh, collection of things that really do reflect in real life as well. Do we want to pop into the actual museum? Do we have a minute? We have a little bit of time. Okay. We're still way ahead of schedule, so we can so we drop can into the museum. Everyone the museum uh, which is, I think, the best part. It's Speaking definitely my favorite part. Yeah, um, just, just a quick thing. Um, some, some museums and aquariums and stuff have actually been using the museum as a virtual field trip for um, some of their guests that normally come to their their museums. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of actually where we got this idea. I know the Monterey Bay Aquarium uh, and the Field Museum in Chicago, they both did virtual tours of this museum because of all of the amazing stuff it has. And they must have talked to an actual museum person when they were developing this game because the way it is laid out is incredibly well designed. Um, you can see Michael's in the, the fossil hall right now. There's an evolutionary tree on the floor so you can actually follow chronologically through time kind of the evolution of these different creatures that you find. Uh, and it's it's one of the only museums Oh, wonderful. So here we have a Diplodocus, which I am quite partial to because here in Pittsburgh we have, of course, uh, several of these Diplodocus Carnegiei named after Andrew Carnegie, who uh, so graciously started my museum. So thanks, Andrew Carnegie. <laughs> but we love uh, Diplodocus here in Pittsburgh, especially. Anyone have any other questions? I couldn't find you, Carissa. You took off your museum professional outfit. Oh, right. Here, let me, I'll put it back on. There we go. Only the most professional of docents. Uh, they also have included this model of the, uh, the asteroid that caused that mass extinction. So we go for scientific accuracy here in Animal Crossing, which is a delight.
All right. So if there, I not seeing any questions. Just just shock is what we've <laughs> we've we've done today. I have uh, a question. Go yes. ahead. Um, who creates the models that are imported into this virtual world? That's a great question. Um, so this is this is a game done by Nintendo. So uh, I it is all. Nintendo. It's not an open source um, thing. So all of it is done by... I, I just saw the credits this morning and I think they do it in-house. I don't remember seeing something that specifically said they contracted out to, to somebody. I think they have their own in-house developers that do it. So you have to have them make the models that are put into your museum. Yes. Yeah, these, any models that we have are what are already available in game. So it kind of depends on whether or not you've collected them or not yet. Um, and there's a lot. Ew, don't sneeze on me, Mary, stop it. It's just allergies. <laughs> Does anyone so. else have questions? Or that was our virtual field trip. Uh, there's a lot. I really do encourage people to also watch the streams done by the Monterey Bay Aquarium and the Field Museum because they have their um, museum professionals take you through and see all the different creatures and kind of in a similar fashion talk about their real life analogs. So. Uh, it's kind of a fun way to visit a museum right now when uh, this is kind of the only option that a lot of people have. So uh, it's it's been a nice thing to to see. It's fun to notice the details too. Like I just noticed they have rack cards down in the gallery. Yeah, there are a lot of tiny, tiny details that make me think that at least one museum person <laughs> was definitely a part of this. Yeah, so as like more and more places are looking for content that stands out, um, this is really, I mean, I think when we all saw the Monterey Bay Aquarium's stream of this, it was just, okay, well, that's one of the more uh, innovative ways of using a video game we've ever seen. And we thought it would be a, kind of an interesting way of, of showcasing that. And there's, again, you can see if you see my little video, um, Chris and her hot dog, there's Anna Green from Berlin. We've got Mary Holt from uh, Cal Academy. And somewhere on the island uh, <laughs> is Paulette Epstein. So uh, thank you all for coming out to the Animal Crossing Island. And there's a dog in the background. So it's like, it, it's the absurdity of all of this. You get it all. It has combined it all. with, with some, some real scientific learning. So that's what we're going for. Uh, so Krista, thank you very much for... Uh, for having us visit your island today and, uh, and taking some time to show what might be the bleeding edge of digital outreach in this. A very uh, bleeding edge. Thank you. This thing. For so me. fun little time for everybody involved. Uh, and of course that puts us uh, ahead of schedule. We're ready for open forum. Um, just a reminder in terms of the next couple of weeks, we're going to a two conference a week next week followed by one conference week, followed by a two, followed by one, kind of the way we've been doing things consistently. All of them will start right at about noon. Uh, for the e-conference next Wednesday, uh, we have a special guest speaker. Uh, Dr. Melinda Messineo is from Ball State University. She's giving a presentation about implicit bias. Uh, so that is in part hosted by Dana Thompson of uh, Ball State University. We'll have... Um, uh, an edition of the record shop next Wednesday. Uh, next Friday, we have we have a, a special guest, uh, a friend of mine from from Orlando, uh, but a guy by the name of Brendan Byrne. He is a space reporter for WMFE, uh, they're the NPR affiliate down in Orlando, and he's agreed to talk to us for an hour about uh, a being a space reporter, which is fantastic, but more importantly, how to work with the media. Um, been in the media for a while. He is. Um, uh, as well versed in astronomy and space science and space exploration as just about anyone in the country nowadays. Uh, and we'll be here for an entire hour for Q&A 
and for talk. And then of course, all of our, our, our weekly segments. So um, something to keep in mind for next week. Uh, but now we'll open it up to open forum. Uh, if anybody has something they'd like to say, of course, since it's open forum, feel free to just unmute and go ahead. Um, I actually do have something. Oh, it's, hey, Jackie Bowman. Yeah, it's just Jackie. Um, hi, um, uh, I'm Jackie. I'm currently living in Buffalo. Uh, I you know, do planetarium and art all together. Um, but I've been thinking about doing a quick little demonstration of uh, how you guys could all use Illustrator, Adobe Illustrator in your, with your planetariums and for like making your own custom star charts and stuff like that. Um, I really like Illustrator. I think it's a really easy program to, uh, to learn and grasp and all that, but there's, I was going to try to do something for today of like a quick little tutorial, but it ended up being, I only had 10 minutes that I could do it and it would take longer than 10 minutes. So I was mainly wondering if anybody would be interested in me doing something like that on here uh, and or uh, in person if in person Glippa happens um, for a workshop. So that's it. You're muted. I, I was aware of that um, now that I am. I'm not. Uh, so yeah, we've got some we've got some interest in the, the chat, um, and of course, I know we'll have some some more interest in that. Um, so we're gonna work with Jackie to make sure we have a a time for a longer um, sort of introduction to Illustrator. Uh, might be a special event, might be one of the the sessions here during a regular e conference. Uh, but of course, we will let you know and do that. And if, of course, if you've seen any of Jackie's work before, um, it's primo stuff. So. Uh, really, really fantastic. It would be great to to have her teaching a class like that. I'm, I, I didn't mean to um, to embarrass you, but it's really good stuff. <laughs> it's just like, okay. Uh, you know, not to sound full of myself, but I know I'm a really good artist, but it's just weird when people point it out. Um, so yeah, um, I did notice in the comment section, people were asking about if Illustrator is open source. Uh, Illustrator is made by Adobe, so it is not open source unfortunately. Um, so I very much uh, am into Adobe, but I don't know the uh, open source programs as well. Thankfully, when I was doing the Wine and Canvas uh, hospitality suite, Waylena was in the room and she was translating all the open source stuff for everyone else. Um, so uh, the open source version of Illustrator is Inkscape, which I I know I know the name and I have never downloaded it on my computer. If I ha if I was made to do it, I could probably figure it out, but vector programs aren't they don't seem like they are very difficult to me, but I don't know how it is to non-art people. So uh, if I were to give a workshop, I could uh, have translations for the open source portions uh, if given enough time to set that up. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jackie, for the offer, and we'll we'll make sure to do that. Uh, anyone else? Uh, Anna Green. Um, I just wanted to give an update. Uh, we found out today that uh, here in Berlin, um, the Stiftung Planetarium Berlin, so all of our planetariums and observatories are going to be remaining closed uh, through the end of July. Right now, the reopen date is August first. So no public programs of any kind on site. All of our summer camps got canceled. Um, we have been uh, starting the online outreach that's new for us. Um, right now, it's almost entirely in German, but I am working on starting to create some English content. So when that comes along, I'll be posting about it in Dome Dialogues. Um, just to, you know, if you want to check out what what the planetariums over here look like. Um, and I'll be doing a uh, live English star hour, uh, starry night in May. So yeah, that's all. Stay healthy. Cool. Very cool. All right, anyone else in open forum? 
All right, not seeing anything. Okay, great. Um, so that means that uh, once again, we are six minutes ahead of schedule, which is wonderful. Uh, so for everyone here, thank you for coming out to the e-conference. We'll see you either at the virtual hospitality suite on Thursday or at the conferences next week. Um, for some of you, I'll see your face in about six minutes as we go beyond the lakes for Clippa. So until then, have a great time. You're all unmuted. See you later. Bye. 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 Bye.